Hello, I think people are still trickling in maybe. Or we're good? We're good to start, excellent. Thank you all and uh, thank you for inviting me. This is wonderful. The first day of the conference already was really exciting, really interesting, so I'm, I'm just very happy to be here. And uh, also much rusted after uh, crashing last night from my jet lag, which is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm raring to go right now, so I'm all recovered. <laughs> Uh, normally when I give a talk, I describe an overarching theory, the attention schema theory of consciousness. But, uh, and originally I was going to do that today, but given the shorter time frame, I thought I would do something different and fun, hopefully fun. And I thought I would focus on one small part of the larger puzzle. And it's a part that I think we have right, because we have enough data to pin it down. And that one small part that I'll tell you about is extramission, the naive folk belief that vision involves something coming out of the eyes and traveling toward objects. And you'll see by the end of the talk how extramission relates to the larger puzzle of consciousness. Uh, yesterday, somebody, several people yesterday said that um, we don't need magic dust. We don't need magic to understand consciousness. Well, I don't believe in magic, but I'm very interested in why people are prone to believe in a magical mind. And I think that's a very huge part of the puzzle of consciousness. Why are people so prone to believe in a magical mind? And we'll see uh, by the end how extra mission uh, can hopefully lead us to some insight into this tendency for people to believe in the magical mind. So extramission, the idea of extramission has been around probably as long as people have been around. The uh, ancient Greeks debated it. The uh, correct laws of optics were worked out by the Arab scientist Al-Haytham. Sometimes pe people say al -Hazen. But even after this, the idea of extramission was still common across many cultures. In 1898, the psychologist Titchener said, he basically said, so many people believe that you can feel someone else's stare on the back of your neck. He said, I'm going to put it to the test. So he did some controlled experiments, and he found that, uh, no, you can't actually feel someone else's stare. <laughs> However, the psychological <coughs> impression is very compelling. Uh, Piaget uh, studied development and found that essentially all children start with this assumption. They assume that vision comes out of the eyes. And then as they grow up, they're taught, culturally taught otherwise. However, even as adults, although most of us have learned the correct version of optics, the idea of extramission still affects our thinking. People all over the world believe in the evil eye, this malign influence that you can direct with your eye. And many people still believe that if you stare hard enough at someone else, they'll feel it and turn around. And even apart from these beliefs, many people, uh, well, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, um, apart from these beliefs, culturally, <coughs> Superman has x-ray vision that can burn holes in things. And we talk about the light of love and the light of intelligence shining from people's eyes. The idea of extramission permeates our thinking and our culture. Now, we wanted to study extramission, and our first study was just a survey to see how many people believe in it. We used the Amazon Mechanical Turk platform. We wanted an online survey so that we could test a broad range of demographics uh, across the United States. And we tested 724 adults. And we asked them, please explain how eyesight or vision works in one to two sentences. And then after they answered this question, a second more pointed question came up. Do you intuitively think of vision as a process where something is leaving your eye or coming in? So of 724 adults, about 2.5% um, believed only in extramission. About 2.5% believed in a combination of extramission and intramission. So altogether, about 5% of these adults believe in some form of extramission. And about 95% get it right. Vision involves only intramission. 
Now, the numbers vary a little depending on level of education. People with just a high school degree are a little more likely to believe. People with a master's degree are less likely. And none of the PhDs in the sample believed in extramission. So there's some hope for humanity is what I'm saying, I think. Uh, however, however, we hypothesized that although most people have learned intellectually that extramission is wrong, we suggest people still construct that model implicitly. It's an automatic part of how we encode the attention of other agents. We encode attention as an invisible energy-like thing generated in an agent that flows out toward the object of attention. In other words, if this hypothesis is correct, then extramission was never really a mistaken theory of optics. It's not really a theory of optics or light. Instead, it's a part of social cognition. It's a part of our natural theory of mind. To get at this hypothesis experimentally, we used a motion adaptation task. And first I'll explain the task, and then I'll tell you how we used it to try to approach this hypothesis. So unlike the online survey, here we brought people into the lab. So imagine you're a subject. You come into the lab, sit down in front of a computer, run a series of trials, and on every trial first you see a fixation point. Then you see this striped pattern drifting slowly to the left or the right for one and a half seconds. And then you see a second motion stimulus, this uh, random dot pattern. Uh, just like Mike talked about yesterday, random dots, they're like busy bees moving around inside that square window. And uh, they're moving randomly, but there is a tendency for more of them to move one direction. And your job is to decide, are they moving more to the right or the left? and you respond as quickly as possible by pressing arrow keys. And that's all you're doing, deciding whether this stimulus is moving to the left or the right. So here's what's going on. There are two motion stimuli in sequence, and it turns out they interact. The first one affects how you process the second one. If the two motions are uh, congruent, turns out it's a little harder to process that second stimulus and your response times are a little longer. And this happens because the first stimulus adapts or fatigues the motion processing machinery just a little bit, just for that direction. And the machinery is a little sluggish in processing the second stimulus. But if the two motions are incongruent, uh, then, there, I have to point it at that. Uh, if the motions are incongruent, that adaptation does not carry forward. It's a little easier to process that second stimulus. Reaction times are shorter. And this is a standard finding. This has been shown before. We quantified it using a simple difference of reaction times. Uh, delta RT is the response time for congruent motion. That's the harder case. Minus the response time for incongruent motion, that's the slightly easier case. So delta RT should be positive, and that's important. You have to understand that to understand the rest of these experiments. A positive delta RT suggests that people encoded the first stimulus as something that moves in a particular direction. And we know that because it had a direction-specific adaptation effect on how people process the second stimulus. So. We took 25 subjects, tested them, and indeed, delta RT is significantly greater than zero, and that's nice, and we're happy, and that's expected. But then we took a second group of, of subjects and tested them on a variant of this paradigm. Here's the variant. First, people looked at a fixation point. Then they saw this static image of a face with bulgy eyes staring at a tree. Okay, sometimes the face is on the left, staring toward the right. Sometimes it's on the right, staring toward the left. Then subjects saw that random dot stimulus right in the empty space between where the face and the tree were. And again, uh, subjects have to decide if the dots are moving left or right. We hypothesized that people would treat this static image as though something were flowing from the face across the empty space to the tree. And that flow should trigger an adaptation effect influencing how people respond to the dots, we should see a positive delta RT. And this is the result. 
delta RT is significantly greater than zero. People are treating a face gazing at a tree literally the same way they treat actual motion visibly flowing across the screen. Well, on interleaved trials, we put a blindfold on the guy. The, the effect went away. The blindfold cuts off the eye beams. We even tried um, replacing the face altogether with an arrow pointing at the tree. And again, there's no significant effect. We have a whole bunch of variants of this, many, many variants of this. I'm only showing you a few. Uh, but you need these eyes staring across the screen to get this effect. And the effect is hidden. It's under the surface. At the end of the experiment, we ask people a whole bunch of questions. And nobody figures out the purpose of the experiment. Nobody figures out that we're testing eye beams. Everyone swears that these weird static images have no effect on how they process the dots. And nobody believes in extramission. When we do these experiments in lab, we tend to use Princeton undergrads, and they're all smarty pants. They don't believe in extramission. Uh, intellectually, they don't believe in this. And they don't know they're doing it, but they are. We all are. We treat a face gazing at an object as though something is flowing from the face to the object. But what about this situation? Kevin is blindfolded, and so uh, we know from the prior experiments the blindfold should cut off the eye beams. But here we told people Kevin is listening intently in case someone sneaks up on the other side of this door. So he's paying attention. If this phenomenon has to do only with eyes and vision, then the adaptation effect should be missing, cut off by that blindfold. But if this effect has to do with a deeper way that we model the attention of other agents, we might expect the adaptation to come back again. We might see a positive delta RT. And this is the result. People do treat this stimulus as though something is emanating from the head toward the object of attention. Now, the eyes, visible eyes, may still be the most important cue that we use to someone else's state of attention, sure. But this phenomenon is not limited to the eyes. Uh, it's not really about eyes or vision or optics. It's about social cognition. It's not really uh, eye beams. It's more like uh, mind beams. And when people talk about theory of mind, usually they're talking about how people reconstruct the contents of other people's minds, the thoughts and the beliefs and the intentions. <clears throat> but here we're talking about how people model the mind itself and how it functions, how a mind reaches out and focuses on an object and acquires the object of its attention. And it's a very strange model. The mind is a invisible plasma generated in the agent and it can flow out toward the object of attention. And we're all doing this at some level. Okay, I'll tell you about a second kind of experiment that we did. We used a, <coughs> a tilt judgment task to determine if attention is perceived as a force that can push on objects. So here's the experiment. Again, you're a subject. Imagine you come in, sit down in the lab, and you uh, run a series of trials. On each trial, you see a display like this. And you've been told that this white rectangle in the middle <coughs> represents a standard sheet of paper that has been rolled into a tube, taped closed, and set upright on the table. Okay, and you're asked to imagine tipping that tube. If you tip it a little bit and let go, it'll right itself. But if you tip it a little too far, it'll reach a critical angle and fall. And so you're asked to imagine what that critical angle might be. And here's how that works. The green arrow tells you what direction to tip. And you use arrow keys to adjust the angle on this vertical line bit by bit getting it exactly where you want it. And then you say, yeah, that's it. It'll definitely fall at that angle. And then you register your response by pressing the return key. And that response might look something like that. And then you go on to the next trial, which might ask you to tip the opposite direction like that. And so on, trial after trial. On some trials, this tube is fatter. On some, it's a little longer, just so that you're always doing a different judgment every time. And on every trial, this head is here, staring at the tube. Sometimes it's on the left. Sometimes it's on the right, staring at the tube. So again, this experiment is spatially counterbalanced. 
Uh, and we don't tell people anything about the head. It's just there. They must think we're crazy, these psychologists. But if, if we're right, then it, uh, if we're right that gaze is perceived as something that can flow and touch and maybe even push on that tube, then the following should be true. On trials, when you're tilting toward the head, you should tilt a little farther before you think the tube will fall over. Because the eye beams are pushing on the tube, helping to hold it up. It's like leaning into a breeze. You can lean farther before you'll fall over. Uh, on, in contrast, on trials, when you tip away from the head, you should uh, tip less far before you think the tube will fall over. Because again, the eye beams are pushing on the tube, this time tending to knock it over. And we quantify that difference as D, the angle, average angle when tipping toward the head minus the average angle when tipping away. And if we're right, D should be positive. If we're wrong and people do not treat gaze as something that pushes on that tube, then D should be zero on average. Or I suppose if people treat gaze as something that sucks on things, then D should be negative. This is the result. D is positive. People treat this stimulus as though something from the head is gently pushing on this tube. And again, we uh, put a blindfold on the guy and the effect goes away. And again, uh, this is implicit. We ask people afterward and nobody realizes they're doing this. Now the effect is tiny, okay? This is a uh, 0.6 degrees. That's the angular difference between tilting toward and tilting away. It's statistically robust, but it's a tiny uh, absolute magnitude. Uh, and we, we did the math based on the geometry of the situation and the weight of a sheet of paper and discovered that I-beams have a force of about one hundredth of a newton, um, <laughs> which is very small. That's like a raisin or maybe a third of a raisin resting on your palm. But it has to be subtle. It has to be small because if we went around perceiving gaze as something that robustly pushes on objects, knocking over garbage cans, then we, we would soon realize that our perception does not match reality. So it has to be small. All right. Uh, uh, here's another experiment. There's many, many, many experiments in this series, but I'm going to limit it. Uh, here's another experiment that we did on two different groups of subjects. So the first group saw a display like this. This looks similar to the last experiment, except uh, there's some pretty Christmas colors. The tube is red, and this wall is green. Uh, on some trials, on other trials, it's reversed, and the tube is green, and the wall is red. On every trial, subjects are asked two questions. First, a prompt comes up that says, Kevin is looking at the tube to determine its color. Does he see a red tube? Well, uh, to answer the question, you can't just look at the tube. You have to also look at Kevin, because sometimes he's blindfolded, and then he definitely does not see a red tube. Well, it's an easy question, but the, the point is it, it forces people to realize Kevin is supposed to be attending to the tube. So people answer the question, yes or no. They uh, see the next prompt. Now please indicate the critical tilt angle. And they do their tilt task. And they uh, uh, go on to the next trial and so on, trial after trial. So what will happen in this experiment when Kevin is supposed to be attending to the tube? Here's the result. It's a replication of the last experiment. When Kevin's eyes are open, uh, D is positive. People treat the stimulus as though the head is pushing on the tube. And when Kevin's eyes are closed, the effect goes away. So that's nice. We're happy. It's a replication. It's very nice. Uh, this is a very um, uh, uh, reliable effect. It's very replicable. Uh, not just here, but in other experiments we've done. <coughs> but here's the kicker. In the second group of subjects, we used exactly the same experiment, same stimuli, same instructions, everything's the same, except on every trial, subjects were told, Kevin is looking past the tube at the wall. Does he see a red wall? So what will happen here? Kevin is still looking. He's gazing toward the tube. Actually, this image is exactly the same. But now he's uh, not paying attention to the tube. He's supposed to be paying attention to this wall. That's the implication. So what will happen in this condition? Here's the result. 
for the first time in all of our experiments, the eyes open condition did not show a significant effect. It doesn't matter whether his eyes are open or covered, people do not treat this stimulus as though the head is pushing on the tube. If Kevin is not paying attention to the tube, then his eye beams, his gaze, does not push on the tube. And this experiment is important because it shows, again, that this phenomenon is not just about vision or gaze. Uh, people do not just um, reconstruct the gaze direction of others. We build a deeper model of the attentional state of other agents. And it's a very strange model, a fluid flow model of other people's attention. Now, I'll tell you about one more experiment. We wanted to know what the brain is doing when people look at a face gazing at an object. And so we did an MRI experiment and we used multi-voxel pattern analysis. And here's the paradigm. Uh, pe uh, uh, people saw a series of stimuli. Each stimulus was one and a half seconds with variable intertrial intervals in between. And sometimes the stimulus, it's hard to see back there, sometimes the stimulus was a field of dots flowing toward the left, sometimes a field of dots flowing toward the right. Sometimes the stimulus was a head gazing at, uh, toward the left at an object, and sometimes it was a head gazing toward the right at an object. And sometimes the stimulus was a blindfolded head aimed toward uh, one direction toward an object, and sometimes it was a blindfolded head aimed the other direction uh, toward the right toward an object. So uh, these are the three stimulus classes. The experiment's slightly more complex, and I'm leaving out some detail, but you can ask me afterward. We used the brain activity data from this trial type, the random dot trial type, to, to train up a neural network classifier on dot motion. And then we asked, can that classifier determine the direction of gaze in this trial type? And here's the results. The slightly um, <clears throat> complicated slide, but I'll go through it uh, systematically. Let's start with the MT complex, MT plus, the main visual motion processing region in the extrastriate cortex. When people look at static images of gaze, their right hemisphere MT, area MT, <coughs> is affected in a way that so closely matches the pattern for actual motion that the motion classifier can determine the direction of gaze. And that's what this bar shows. But when people look at a blindfolded face gazing at an object, the motion classifier fails. MT does not treat that stimulus like a motion stimulus. And that's what this bar shows. These two are significantly different from each other. So visual motion area MT, at least on the right side, treats a face gazing at an object as though something is literally flowing from the face toward the object. <clears throat> now, there are two other brain areas that showed a similar pattern of activity, and both are in the temporoparietal junction, the TPJ. One is on the right hemisphere and one's in the left hemisphere. The TPJ classically involved in theory of mind. So these results suggest a collaboration between low-level motion areas and theory of mind areas in order to build a fluid flow model of other people's attention. Now, what have we found? People implicitly model other people's attention in a simplified schematic way as an invisible energy-like stuff generated in an agent, traveling out to and sometimes even physically affecting the object of attention. And we all do this whether we realize it or not, however strange this is, we're all doing this. The purpose of the brain's models is not to be physically accurate. The purpose is to be useful and a fluid flow model of other people's attention may be a useful, efficient, um, quick model, a quick way to keep track of who is attending to what and by how much in a complex social environment. 
So we suggest people evolved this. This is evolved into our social machinery because it's a quick and easy part of social cognition. We suggest everyone has this at some level. We're using it all the time and it's part of what makes us socially intelligent. Rapidly, quickly socially intelligent. And this uh, implicit model might help explain the extraordinary cultural persistence and the intuitive appeal of the idea of a mental substance. This is the original theory of consciousness. Now Descartes may have named it, but the idea of a mental substance is, is the most common theory, theory in quotes, theory of consciousness across cultures and across history. Right? The, uh, the mind as an invisible energy-like essence that can flow, and sometimes it flows out of the eyes, sometimes it flows out of your body altogether. It's your soul, your uh, ghost, your chi, your ka, whatever culture, cultural term you want. The other day I was watching Star Trek with my son. He's in a Star Trek phase right now. And the, uh, the alien of the week was pure consciousness energy that could float around and then get into things and inhabit them. And I was watching that thinking, man, this intuition is everywhere. And maybe the reason why these intuitions and beliefs, why these beliefs have so much cultural traction is uh, because they are exaggerations of and elaborations on a deeper social cognitive model that we all have. Now, there's three key lessons here in this talk. One, we don't actually have a mental substance. <laughs> Two, we can explain why people are prone to believe. And not just believe. I mean, there's uh, some people who think this is true. Uh, and there are many people who don't think it's true. But we have a very powerful intuition that biases us in that direction. And number three, this is not just a mistaken theory. It's not just people being stupid or superstitious. Instead, it serves a useful cognitive function. Uh, mind beams. Mind beams are not just pure fiction. Mind beams are a simplified um, schematic cartoonish model of something that really does exist. The attentional state of other agents. And it's useful uh, for the brain to construct these very fast simple models uh, to keep track of its world in a rapid manner. So these are the three key lessons. I did not get a chance today to talk about the larger attention schema theory uh, of consciousness, just this teeny, teeny little sliver. Uh, but actually, it's very easy at this point to summarize at least the spirit of the theory, uh, which goes something like this. There are lots of components to consciousness, lots of aspects to it. Some are more mechanistic and um, easier to study scientifically. Some are more magical and uh, non-physical. And the heart, I think, the heart of the problem of consciousness, the reason why it's been so hard and so contentious is because part of it is mechanistic science and part of it is magic. And there's a divide. It's very hard to get those two to mesh. Uh, but maybe the more magical aspects of consciousness can be understood with the same kind of uh, um, argument structure. Uh, there, that, that is, we can understand why people are so prone to believe in magic, why it's so uh, intuitively compelling that sometimes it's almost impossible to convince people otherwise. So uh, I think that the magical side of consciousness is the heart of what's so hard to study about it, and this is a, a, a way to address that, explaining why people are so prone to believe in the magical mind. I have only one short little point that I want to make. I know I'm probably way over time, but I do want to make one, one brief point. Uh, mind beams, are they really evolutionarily built in uh, to the primate brain as part of our social machinery at a deep level? Or is this more superficial cultural learning? Big question, very important question for us. We think it's built in at a deep level. We don't think it's culturally learned because if anything, the cultural learning goes the other direction, teaching children who start out assuming that's true, teaching them that it isn't true. But there is a way to get at this experimentally, and that would be to take our motion adaptation task and test it in monkeys and see if monkeys 
perceive mind beams the same way that people do. And so I'm very, very interested if there's anyone out there who has monkeys who can perform dot motion direction judgments. <laughs> uh, very interested, at least talking about the possibility of a really interesting uh, behavioral, quick, easy behavioral study that could get at a question that's of great interest to us. And with that, I'm going to end. Uh, and I hope I didn't go too over time. But thank you. I'm going to get fired then if I take you up your, 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 uh, uh, you can use it, there are microphones there on the table. Oh, right. For the speakers. Uh, Leon. So this is really amazing, amazing, amazing results. Uh, I just want to ask a technical question that I'm sure you've been asked so many times. What about eye movements of the subjects? Yeah. So we measure eye movements. So the subjects are asked to fixate. And so there's, uh, and, and they do quite well. And there's several things we can do. One is we can um, make sure they're fixating. And the second thing we can do is assess whether the eye movements they do make correlate with these results, and they don't. And so for example, rather than using, in, in so that in, in that um, fMRI study, <coughs> rather than use brain activity to train the classifier, we can use eye movement and eye position to train the classifier, and then see if it can still uh, predict the main result, and it can't. So eye movements are not, not what's going on here. It's a good question, though. Uh, sure. Fascinating. You, you emphasize the, the other mind aspect. But you know, as I was watching your, your test, I myself was wondering whether I'm tilting the, yeah. the tube. Yes. Did you try ever to do it on the person? Because you could play this thing in depth. Yeah, in this we tried. Uh, I think that. It's a little easier to study and to design paradigms around uh, modeling other people's attention. Modeling your own attention is a really rich, interesting aspect of, of this whole theoretical structure that we're working in. And we're super interested in that. We couldn't figure out how to cleanly do the experiment you're asking about. Uh, we had. With the stereo, very simple. Yeah. The, the problem is there's too many things that are not counterbalanced. Because as it comes toward you, it gets larger, it looms. You might cringe because it's going to hit you in the face. And we just didn't quite trust it. And we're still racking our brains to figure out how to test that. That's one of our, our wish list experiments, exactly that one. But we have to work out the details. Anyway, another, oh. Uh, oh, yes. If you don't assume that there's necessarily an extra mission, but that what people think is that uh, there is something active about any kind of perception, active in the sense that you need a mind for that, and this mind has to be active yeah. in a particular way. Yeah. This then would, uh, I think, uh, sort of explain the same results, but without the necessity of actually assuming that there is something emanating. It is true that when you're doing the tilting experiments, there is some, some, some kind of, as yeah. if there is some kind That's of right. force exerted on yes. it. But it could be a kind of illusion uh, uh, for the, the person that is, that is due to the fact that it believes that it is something active. And something active usually implies yeah. some kind of force. So but, that but so, and the other point I just wanted to mention is that th there are this beautif there's this beautiful uh, uh, thing about sclera, about the fact that we have white around our yes. eyes. And this has evolved in human evolution in order uh, to, to facilitate gaze yes. following. Yes. And uh, so, so that we can see what others saw and so on. It's Tomasello and her. Yes. And uh, so that relates to, to this. Right. And it's very interesting. It would be very interesting to do an experiment when you have a sclera and you don't have a sclera in the, in the gazing eye. Right. Uh, to see whether it, it would uh, yeah. it so make a difference to your experiments. Le let me address both points. Number one, the tube tilt experiment does not imply a flow through the intervening space. It just implies some extra influence on the tube. And you're absolutely right about that. But the motion adaptation experiments and the MRI experiment in MT suggests that the area in between, the empty space in between, is adapting motion in a particular direction. And so we suggest that this implies there's an actual, we, we think it's an example of evolutionary uh, um, acceptation. That is, there's this simple mechanism for detecting flow and movement. And it got partially hijacked and used 
to draw uh, nice convenient arrows from agents to things they're attending to. So it's a simple trick, it's like a hack uh, to make the system uh, efficient at figuring out who's attending to what. But the motion adaptation experiment suggests an actual literal flow that we, we're perceiving. Uh, the sclera thing, um, I can actually answer that question because we've done many variants of it. And I, it, I, I think the sclera, white sclera, is hugely important in enhancing how we can tell the direction of gaze. But people are so good at eyes that cartoon eyes with no sclera at all, anything that looks vaguely like it has eyes uh, can produce some of these effects. And so we've seen that when we have heads. We've tried a dog heads, uh, which have pure black eyes and, and um, other, other things like that. And you, do, uh, you actually still get these effects. And I think it's just because people are really. Uh, that's not as clear yet. Uh, so there may be something in that. But I think people are just really good generalists. Uh, but that's an excellent point, though. Yes. Yeah, hi. Um, so, oh, hey. okay, good. Uh, so as, as the resident <coughs> dualist, um, oh. <laughs> uh, uh -oh. I, so I, I think that there's, there's an epistemic issue here of, of what you think of as, as what, is, what is fundamental and we know about, like for sure, and what is an, an illusion, right? So, so your perspective is that the physical world exists yes. and, and consciousness is, is a physical thing and it's just we have, our brain is tricking us into thinking that we, I, I, I don't know if you would use that phraseology, but it's some sort of uh, illusion, but really it's, it's a physical, it's just a physical thing that's happening. But I think the Cartesian perspective very explicitly is, is that the, the axioms are the other way around. In other words, the, the thing that you can be certain about is your phenomenal conscious experience, and that is the most basic fundamental thing. And the outside world is something that, that we learn about indirectly yeah. through our conscious phenomenal e experience. Yeah. So, so I, I guess what I'm saying is that there's sort of a, a symmetry between what, what you think is real and what you think is an illusion, and that can go in, uh -huh. uh, in, in both directions. Why do you think that the physical world is real right. and our phenomenal experience right. is elusive? Well, thank you for that. I uh, uh, yeah, we probably, we probably do disagree on all kinds of interesting <laughs> things. I'm trying to figure out what aspect of that is most efficient to, to address. Um, I do think there's a physically real world. I think it's a very strange world that we barely know about through science. And I think, you know, a quantum physics tells us that this stage is a funky quantum mist and not the thing we think it is. Uh, I think there's, there's a real world and the brain reconstructs that world. Uh, I think it's very comfortable for neuroscientists, especially perceptual neuroscientists, to think in terms of the brain building simplified models of what's out there. And our understanding of the world is based on these simplified models. And that's kind of what I'm saying here too. Uh, there's a real thing, the brain builds simplified models of it, and based on those models we have a kind of magicalist notion of what consciousness is. Uh, or in this case, just one tiny little aspect of consciousness. Uh, but I would say, uh, you're right, I wouldn't have used that phraseology. Many people use the term illusion to refer to consciousness. And I, I don't mind people saying that my theories are illusionist theories, but I actually don't <coughs> like that word and I don't think that's true. I would say they're caricatures, not illusions. Uh, the, the mind beams are not illusions, they're caricatures of something real. And the word illusion implies something created de novo and is fake and there's no reality to it. Uh, and I don't want to make that implication. I think mind beams are caricatures of something real. So I'm not that fond of the word illusion, consciousness as an illusion. I'm not, that's not quite my, my cup of tea as they say. Oh, Hi. yes. Th thank you for your beautiful talk. I, ha thank you. I have, may, may, I don't know where you have um, maybe thought of this experiment, but I was thinking a way to test the distinction between the eyes versus the theory of mind is you have your same subject, you, but you tell them the story that this is a blind person. Yeah. And I wondered, you know, what would you predict that's going to happen in that oh, case? Oh, we think that uh, uh, just like when we blindfolded Kevin and told people he was listening that we would see um, mind beams. That's, that's our assumption. Uh, we, we also did, I, th among the many variants, we did psychic Kevin. Uh, that was an earlier version. That worked too. Kevin the psychic closed his eyes and there was a chair behind him. So he's not even facing the right way. Well, it wasn't a chair. It could be a chair or a table and he's trying to figure out what it is. And he's like, it's a, it's a, and so, uh, and in that condition, we still got these beams coming out of him toward the object. So it's really, it's, it's um, attention or some kind of attentive processing 
spatially focused that's producing these effects. So we have, but I think a blind Kevin would, we always name them Kevin, I don't know why. <laughs> Are there any Kevins here? <laughs> I apologize. For They're in your lab. Uh, no, well, I have a puppet, that a uh, ventriloquist puppet, that I use sometimes to make the point of um, uh, uh, how we attribute mental states to things that don't have them. And the puppet's name is Kevin, so he's kind of become the mascot for all things in the lab. Um, hi, here. Oh, yeah. Um, OK, so I wanted to, to ask first, um, because you basically showed that you don't really need even eyes to uh, elicit these effects. So <coughs> what would you say are the minimal conditions um, to show this yeah. effect? And another small question, did you try this on uh, patients that have problems with the theory of mind, like uh, autistic? Yeah. We haven't tried this on patients. And that's a really good uh, question. We would love to. It's, it's such an interesting idea, uh, patients with theory of mind issues. We would expect would, would show deficits in this. Uh, uh, so sorry, the first question was? the minimal conditions? Oh, minimal conditions. Well, I do think that an eye, an eye is a minimal condition. But you can also, in, in, in the sense that it's the easiest, simplest way to get it, an eye pointed at something. Yeah, you but you, you, can get, you can get it without the eye if you add a bunch of other um, uh, cues uh, or, or uh, a cognitive story. So I think what's going on is the model, like many models, the model is constructed based on cues that pin it down, that constrain it. Many different cues can constrain it. And eyes are one of the main ones, but you don't need that one. Other cues can constrain it. Just your knowledge of the social context can constrain the model. But the model gets built anyway. And so, uh, so, so sometimes I compare it to the uh, body schema, like your, your model of your arm. Your brain has a model of the arm. And it's usually constrained by somatosensory input from your arm. But if you cut your arm off, um, if you lose your arm, the model might still exist as a phantom limb. So the model is there, the brain's building it, but these cues like the eyes help constrain the model. I, I would put it that way. It's, it's always there, basically. Anyway. Great. Oh, I have to stop. Thank you. Okay.